Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this uh, roundtable called Risk and Boldness. I'm very happy to be with you, and I want to remind you to wear your mask, which is um, absolutely mandatory for these, uh, these debates this afternoon. So I would like to uh, tell you that we have a great panel uh, which is very gender balanced, four against four, so very balanced again, and with great backgrounds to talk about a topic that came out in a very uh, brutal way, but fascinating nonetheless during this crisis. So I want to be uh, provoking you a bit by introducing this roundtable, all the questions that came to my mind on the vaccine strategy, for example, first of all, is France or Europe have not been a bit behind? Are they still a bold and courageous nation and continent? Haven't we lost the taste for risk? The training of our elite was not failing in front of this crisis, and maybe Europe did not step up to the answer to the vaccine like our neighbors. Why didn't we have vaccines in France? What were the obstacles to the baldness in medical uh, research to manufacture the vaccine? I would like to start with this example, but I'm not going to ask my guests to answer those questions that are very precise and very uh, particular. But I wanted to start with this example because for me, it raised the question these assessments how uh, being made how can we make sure that we don't miss out on the next opportunities how do we engage in recovery and what were the obstacles and the financing levers that we could have used are those uh, huge investments that were made for the vaccines, could they have been possible on our soil? How can we limit the risk for elderly populations that we have in Europe? Everybody, I'm sure, asked those questions. So we're going to be looking for answers with uh, Emmanuel Oriol, who's a member of the Sacs Economies, uh, Alexandre Bompard, who's the CEO of Carrefour, Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, who's chairman of the board of directors of NG, and the finance uh, people from the risk, Stéphane Dedeyan, who's the CEO for CNP Assurance for Insurance, and Claire Iscop, who's CEO and chairwoman of the board of management of Euler Hermès, who's the leader of uh, um, insuring companies against risk, and somebody who's in charge of our present and our future, Sandrine Emery, who's chairwoman of the board for Fonds de Retraite pour les... <coughs> Fonds de réserve pour les retraites. Sorry, Emmanuel, you have the floor. Thank you uh, all for being here with us. The title is Boldness, Risk and Audacity. Uh, the risks that we're supposed to take to innovate are the risks that uh, have been taken by individuals. And you know that man is the balance of prudence and audacity. And for everything that touches upon the human, there's some that have more or less. So the balance between risk and audacity is varies from one individual to the other. Some are more risk uh, prone than others or audacious than others. Why am I saying that? It's because, as we said in an introduction, the vaccine was not developed in France. It was vaccines in general. They were developed in the US by who? By immigrants uh, who, for the most part, were coming from Europe. So you may think it's a pure coincidence. No, it is not a coincidence. Why? Because the Immigrants are people who leave voluntarily their country to go far away from home. So they're people who like risk. So it's not a coincidence because if you look in wealthy countries, as in poor countries, who are the entrepreneurs? Immigrants account for a large part of entrepreneurs. It is true in the US, it is true in Europe, it is true in sub-Saharan Africa with the Lebanese uh, population. So immigrants in general, and even refugees or uh, economic refugees are ambitious and uh, they like to uh, take risks. 
and they're also overrepresented among those who innovate. A fourth of the patents in the US are filed by immigrants. So you can see that, again, they are overrepresented with anything that has to do with risk taking. Why am I mentioning this? Because France, for many years, unfortunately, has completely uh, closed its door to uh, immigration and particularly qualified immigration, contrary to what we hear in the media. We have an immigration that is very low, 200,000 or 230,000 uh, people by year, per year. So we're lower than most of the OECD uh, countries or Switzerland that have more immigrants than we do. Since we have uh, closed all the, the doors uh, to immigrants, the only people we're letting in the country are people coming to because part of their families are there, not people who are um, qualified. So the financial question is very important here, and we have, uh, we have people who uh, innovated because they couldn't find, and because they couldn't find the financing at home, they left for the US. So opening up to an international immigration uh, is uh, a way for France to find back its place in the global, um, st on the global stage. So yes, I used to be um, provoking uh, people, but I think you, uh, you outdid me. I would like to go back to you, Alexandre Bompard, sorry, on the analysis of the crisis. Do you really feel that uh, we were taken back and we didn't know how to manage the risk? And do you think we're ready for tomorrow? Um, it is true that you uh, outdid us. Uh, if we go back to your initial question, why no vaccines? I'm not a specialist of vaccination, but if I look at the situation, even if we don't have enough immigrants, uh, the qualified or the chosen immigrants, we still have beautiful schools and we have uh, good researchers, we have good engineers, we have Nobel Prizes. The answer is yes. Do we have private capital? Maybe not enough, but we do still have them. Do we have public help, public subsidies? Yes. Do we have private groups who can invest? The answer is yes. And however, it didn't work. Why didn't work? If you analyze those who managed to do it, the Pfizer's and the Moderna, we could see that the researchers work with the entrepreneurs who worked with the capital, who worked with states. We have a very difficulty to match all these components and make them work together. There's two reasons for that. There's a huge suspicion, uh, spirit of suspicion in our, in our country. Um, the idea that when we pick someone, we have to make sure that not only he's the best, but he has no conflict of interest with no one. And if that's the case, maybe we can appoint him to an important position. Second, the formalism of uh, the state. It, it's red tape, this excess of rules and red tape. So where the hybrid solutions, where the private-public uh, partnerships are necessary, we don't know how to do that because we are a state before being a nation. And the state has to play this role of coordination. Sometimes the state knows how to do it. I'm going to take the example of my sector of activity with the crisis starts. Great management for a few weeks of all the actors uh, with the minister of the finance and the economy himself, with the industrial, the, log the people in charge of logistics, um, which was only one idea in mind. Let's not add to the sanitary crisis a food crisis. So let's get find the solutions. A few weeks go by and then go back to Kafka, to red tape, to bureaucracy, the natural bureaucracy, you know, this, uh, the non-essential trade. And that's the administration, you know, gets stubborn about it. It's a meetings within the ministries to know if we could sell makeup or hydrating cream, you know, or pajamas for kids could be sold in supermarkets, this whole debate. So if we were to send the prefects in the stores to check that everything was 
according to the rules. So they gave me the feeling that we had, it was so difficult for us to put aside this tendency, this bureaucratic trend, instead of trusting ourselves and, you know, thinking that the, we went back to our natural uh, tendency, go back to normal, have another law on uh, really trade uh, relations. We make it even more bureaucratic than it was, and that was not needed. So this is one of the explanation of our difficulties to function together and to get the best of the components that are all on the table. This is the first analysis. Thank you very much. Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, uh, we have a few challenges uh, to address with uh, what Alexandre Montbard said. I'm going to take uh, the opposite side of Alexandre, even if I could have probably uh, spoken the same words. Uh, that's, that's really the French elite, isn't it? But, um, you know, coins have often two faces, so I'm going to look at, at that with my uh, optimistic uh, glasses today. Three billion people who are vaccinated today, two-thirds with the vaccines with AR ARN that sounded like science fiction three years ago. So I think that this is a success. Of course, uh, the bets made by the French uh, groups uh, were not up to, the, to the, the, the expectations, but the result is there. Another fact, the European Commission in a few weeks is going to make a decision uh, of the date of the stoppage of the production, manufacturing of thermal engine cars, which means that in 20 years we'll have completely changed this uh, automotive industry. What? How did the media react to this restructuring, the uh, industrialization, and this is a consequence of this decision, but insisting on it was just uh, being very pessimistic by bringing up the end of the foundry industry due to this change of uh, cars manufacturing. I think the crisis is giving us great opportunities to uh, start a number of transformations much more quicker than we did before. Something that struck me with NG, and I see my colleagues in the front row, we managed in 48 hours to put 50,000 people in uh, remote working, which means that when we need to go fast, we can transform fast. A second consequence, uh, digitalization, very quick digitalization. That gives me the feeling that we're at the beginning of a new industrial revolution of a very quick uh, transformation where Europe has a card to play. And we need to be convinced of that. What do we need to do that to play this card properly? is uh, to show China and the U.S. that we are in the game. Uh, we need to have a government that is reinventing himself, itself uh, instead of deciding if we're selling pajamas or not in supermarkets. We need a strategist, uh, a government that is a strategist and is not acting as a fireman to put out fires, but helps us project ourselves in the future and create trust. Because without trust, we can't imagine these uh, transformations. We have to accept those transformations as well, which is uh, difficult in our European culture, where, however, we have the tools to do it. The social breaks that we've used, uh, the culture of social dialogue, uh, uh, should enable us to manage these transformations, and uh, it's difficult for us to do. We need to. Um, an, eco an ecosystem of innovation that is more efficient. We need a link between companies and universities. We need something that is more productive. We need financing to scale up our startups. And last point, and this is where I'm going to answer your question on the challenges of, en of the energy sector. We need projects that are mobilizing, and we don't have enough of those. I come from a generation who saw the first Airbus, the first Concorde, the first TGV uh, do Paris-Lyon in two hours. And when I'm looking for their equivalents today, I don't 
find anything. It's mostly SpaceX, Blue Origin, not to say the word of Tesla, uh, mostly words uh, that are Anglo-Saxon. So in Europe, we're lacking uh, projects that are really mobilizing. I have one project, uh, which is hydrogen. I know there's a lot of talk about that because it's a very trendy uh, topic. But we know today that we can run a bus on hydrogen. We know that we can have green hydrogen in an industrial company of chemistry, of re refining. I think the real ambition on which Europe could mobilize itself is to produce green, to make out of green hydrogen the fluid that would um, uh, supply Europe. So I think we have the capacity in Europe to realize this dream. And if we set ourselves some very strong ambitions, we are capable to align the energies. So I hear the criticism from the media who always says, always sees the bad side of things. That could be a blocking point as well for innovation. The share of uh, mediatization of project is here and I hear that and I take my part by sitting here at this table. I mentioned to you the financing that is necessary to innovate and to be bold and to take risks. Uh, Stéphane de Deillon, do you see uh, any financial levers that can be uh, unblocked or do we have everything we need? Of course, there are some financial levers to use. Uh, insurers, of course, uh, bring their part, their institutional investors. But before we get into that, I would like to give my view from the point of view of a CEO. I am in a job where uh, we're surrounded with risks uh, constantly, and we see all these threats and all these difficulties. And one day, I had a chance to talk to uh, Jean-Louis Etienne, you know, who's an explorer. Um, and I told him, Jean-Louis, when you go on expedition, you're surrounded with risk constantly. How do you manage to live with all this risk? And he gave me an answer that inspired me a lot. He told me, you know, in fact, I realized that when you go half of the way, life takes care of the second part of the way, second half of the way for you. So how, as a uh, manager of a company, uh, I create the conditions so people can go half of the way, so they can dare go half of the way. And if we want to answer this question on how do you manage risk in a company that is more, in a society, sorry, that is more and more uh, risk adverse, there's a personal responsibility of each manager. It's all the more important that if you look at the way our French society manages risk, it is getting more and more risk adverse. I have a very easy indicator. It's the percentage of the GDP that you allocate to insurance. That gives you an idea of the price that you're willing to pay to cover the risks. The percent of the GDP can dedicated to um, insurance is even higher than the GDP is higher. So means that the country needs to have a certain level of GDP to be able to afford an insurance. And it also means that the more you create richness, the more you want to protect it. So in a certain way, the more a nation evolves and is developed, and the more it is afraid to lose. And facing this nation in the globalization, there are some younger countries that have much more or less to lose. And instead of thinking of them as threats, we're being more and more protectionist, and it's a downward spiral. So we have a big responsibility to create the conditions for to do the first half of the journey and to get out of this vicious circle that could uh, make us want to uh, just look at ourselves and not at others. And I remind you that in psychology, a psychosis is when you have no more tolerance to any form of risk. So you can see that it has to, it goes back to this percentage of the GDP that is dedicated to the risk, to protecting ourselves from risk. How do we get out of it? Well, as a business executive, we have to think about how we try to, uh, if I'm challenging my, uh, things enough, if I'm capable yeah, to challenge things, to um, uh, I check myself on that every day. I, 
because it's vital for the economy. And then there are some solutions, of course, uh, that are brought by insurers. If I take the example of CNP insurance, we're an institutional investor, so it's easy to understand because we basically collect the insurance premiums before we pay for uh, the, the payments. So a major part of our turnover is invested in companies, and we have a real capacity to finance the equity of the entrepreneurs who will be disruptive and who will innovate. So we absolutely need to be bold to risk our equity again on that. But we have to do that against IFR 17, which is uh, solvability two, which is taxing us every time uh, we, we do something. But there's a responsibility against those models. I decide to risk my p &L. It's also our job of insurers how do we uh, push back the limits of insurance? How do we make sure that more and more people get insured? And uh, how do we take more risks? That's part of our job. We also have to work in prevention of risk, and that's where I'm going to end. First lever, if I am a shareholder of a major company with my policy of voting at uh, the board meetings, I can push for a decarbonation of the industry, and I can have a long-term vision to drop the CO2 to mitigate the climate risk, and that's going to have an impact of less pandemics, less uh, natural disasters, uh, because those are sinister for me. Uh, and the second thing is I can encourage uh, virtuous behaviors because if I give more guarantees or lower prices to actors who shows that they have a preventive behavior, then I favor risk prevention and their uh, decrease and the capacity to take other risks elsewhere. Thank you very much, Stéphane Dédéillon. It is very clear. Um, I, re I retain our acceptability to risk. Us as citizens, as individuals, are we ready to accept that? Don't we want to be reassured and insured all the time? So what do you think of that? What do you have to say about that? How do you anticipate that? How do you, can you convince us? Well, first I'd like to react on what Alexander said earlier. I think we have to resist not only uh, in uh, returning to uh, the previous bureaucracy, but resisting to more bureaucracy, and the re natural reflex of government, which is a ref reflex of uh, preservation, is to add on regulation to try to prevent the next crisis. <clears throat> the next crisis, we don't know where it's going to come from, but in the meantime, we'll have set a frame, a framework with constraints. Working under constraint is less productive than a free, uh, free work. So we really have to try to. Uh, ensure that we do not fall into this increased bureaucracy and uh, regulations. You talked about investments earlier. Here again, we have to liberate investments. That means for individuals, uh, one tax. If we want to remunerate the risk, we have to encourage people to take risk, uh, make risky investments, and and of course, taxes should be should uh, should follow. Um, and uh, for institutions such as CNP, we know that the solvability two at the origin, it points to the savings re generated um, by the, those institutions through public debt because there's a very l small charge for bankers. And so with this system, we've uh, pointed to the collected uh, savings rather than towards innovation. Uh, rather than on uh, uh, private uh, businesses. And I think this has to be rebalanced to liberate financing in this sector. I think our duty as uh, uh, business leaders is to um, liberate initiatives in our own businesses, uh, have the courage to, uh, to uh, hire more technological profiles. You have to try to copy what's being done in the internet platforms, for example, in our sectors. We have a lot of uh, highly successful uh, internet platforms. It means uh, giving the right to error, uh, encourage those who do, 
rather than those who uh, administrate, those who create, to encourage them to, and that that's important. And along the same line, uh, to make sure that there is a, a, a favorable uh, framework or uh, ease of access to financing, having a tax system that's uh, a, a, um, that is encouraging, um, uh, introduce more flexibility has is very virtuous if you want to liberate initiatives and the uh, will to uh, to undertake and the last point i wanted to mention is that we need to we have schools <clears throat> train an elite wonderful elite but unfortunately this elite uh, leaves the country because they they earn more money elsewhere abroad and we need to the, the individual uh, success in france is uh, has a bad reputation. It's a bit shameful. We don't talk about. We don't talk money in France, much less than in the U.S., for example. And I think we need to cultivate the this uh, will to uh, undertake, to succeed, and to to be successful. And this go, passes through a change in the state of mind of our elite. And we uh, we got to be careful not to break up uh, the, the the elite system in France, which is the pride of France, and it. Uh, uh, it's very important uh, uh, for France, and uh, we have a very good reputation to that effect. Uh, at RMS, we do credit insurance. Uh, we insure uh, uh, businesses against uh, uh, the, the, the commercial risk. Uh, this enables to multiply commercial exchanches. Uh, there's uh, 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 the wealth is in is in people, and people who are uh, confident. And so we work at uh, ensuring to protect this confidence. We're not very well known by the general public, but uh, credit insurance uh, at Zolet covers about 900 billion of, uh, 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 of commercial guarantees. So, so France is not, uh, it doesn't export enough. We don't have the, we're not audacious to export like the Germans or the Italians. We have 1% of businesses who generate 85% of our export uh, numbers. In comparison, Italy, 50% uh, of the exports are done by the SMEs in Italy. So we have to accompany uh, uh, enterprises for the exports. So you, it's very important to, 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 to protect trust, confidence, collective confidence, uh, the trust of uh, uh, the person who's willing to take a risk, uh, the, the, the uh, trust in the future, uh, in retirement, from, yes. Faced with this risk, how can we be more audacious if we measure how much we insurance we take? Uh, Sixty percent of the GDP we invest in our retirement plans, our pension plans. So with the COVID, we learn lessons of risk and audacity. The pandemic. If you look at the map of uh, risks, uh, solvability two, for example. Uh, plan, plan this uh, centennial pandemic uh, with a 15% uh, increased death rate. And so we had envisaged that, uh, but it did not take place as planned. And uh, we didn't envisage uh, systemic operational risk as what we saw. And what we learned with the COVID crisis is that we always, we always, we're always wrong when we plan risks. But we learned wonderful lessons in terms of audacity. We uh, made uh, the regulations more flexible. Uh, the vaccination was not developed in France, but uh, were more or less uh, all vaccinated. And maybe the RNA M um, couldn't have worked. Maybe it wouldn't have worked. It, it's possible that it, it, it wouldn't work, uh, but it did. And we have a cultural framework that is moving. Uh, we don't know what tomorrow is made of, the world of tomorrow. Some people will say that it's a world with solar, uh, unlimited uh, solar energy transformed in, in uh, uh, stored hydrogen. Others see the future uh, like uh, Mad Max uh, and or Blade Runner. So a lot of po different scenarios and we need to learn to live with that and make the right choices. We know that innovation is the key uh, to growth. Uh, the uh, uh, European studies in uh, Europe show that two-thirds of the growth since 2014 is due to innovation. And if you look at the um, uh, European innovation, you see that France 
is in a pretty good position. It's second just after Germany, practically at the same level as the U.S. That's surprising uh, when you look at the strengths of France in terms of innovation. Uh, there's notably the public financing, private financing, um, the people, the workforce, but what's lacking. Uh, it's the markets, what Clarice was saying earlier. So we have positive elements. Uh, when I, I was talking to um, uh, the head of an uh, insurance startup, and he said, strange, when I uh, talk to a French investor, he looks at my slide, he says, oh, slide 24, it's in French, you forgot to translate it. And when I uh, go to an American fund, they will tell me, well, it's wonderful what you do. Here you're asking for 50 million, but if I gave you 100 million, what would you do? So it's not really not the same rationale, if you want. So uh, how can we change this in France? How can, um, we started with the financing of uh, the technologies. The diagnosis was, was done. Um, and there was a report made, and we implemented not only uh, financial systems, but an ecosystem, because we need uh, an ecosystem to f finance uh, technology. Uh, we have some uh, uh, aids uh, for listing uh, the companies, reserve funds. Is uh, Fond Reserve is par a partner in this initiative. And uh, what I wanted to add to this is uh, with uh, as uh, an accountant, I think we have to stop thinking averages. We do, you, you don't want to reach the mean value. The private equity in France, for example, if you look at the numbers, it uh, generated 11% since the origin of the fund. There is, so 25% uh, of the funds uh, ge generate about 25% as an average. And in the lower quarter, it's 5% for the investors. So. Uh, lesson learned here is you have to take risks, you have to finance the risks, but you have to be ready to uh, accept the fact that it won't, it doesn't work. You have to be ready to lose. You shouldn't stigmatize uh, failure or errors. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> you don't celebrate the day you 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 failed. Uh, no, you have to think. You know, this is what I learned in this failure, and you have to dare talk about it also. Uh, the Fonds de Reserve, uh, the Reserve Fund, uh, we have reserves to 14% uh, of the GDPs. We pay one billion every day for all pension plans. And uh, the Reserve Plan, we manage 25 billion today. So it's uh, really a, a safety, a security cushion to reimburse the debt that we um, had to take to reimburse the, the, the pensions or the retirement plans. Uh, and I think that we can invest 60% uh, in performance uh, uh, assets. And with the social partners, with the state representative of the states and uh, the qualified personalities, we could work on that, knowing that uh, and we did this in June 2020 when the markets in March uh, had, drawn, uh, had fallen. And we decided to continue to invest in 54% in, uh, in equity knowing that the models were telling me that we had five or 15 percent chances depending on the model to be uh, in a negative uh, assets at the end of the year so but we knew what we were doing my message would be let's uh, uh, be ambitious but not stigmatize the uh, small failures and let's create the day of the failure <laughs> and lessons learned from failures that's what i'll remember of your speech. Uh, you can ask questions. You can send them by mail if you buy in on the uh, on the uh, website. Uh, anyway, the first analysis of what you just heard. Uh, well, I'll go back on some of the things that were mentioned here. I uh, noted from Claris the um, administrative burden. Uh, but who are these people in the administration? They're not the people who really enjoy taking risks. They don't work in the administration. They don't like taking risks. I'm part of that. So I'm the typical example of someone. Uh, but I, I broke my foot, which is not good. But anyway, uh, let's remember uh, Rosenbach show that we crucified because she ordered too many vaccines some time ago in a previous uh, pandemic. Uh, the day of the failure, uh, contaminated blood, for example, uh, people have careers, they don't like risk. 
and they will be just uh, crucified if they do the least mistake. And in the strategy, they prefer not to have an enormous benefit insofar as, as an individual, I don't take that risk. So the, the responsibility of the risk of so this first problem, so the administrative burden or weight, it's not the result of uh, individuals, but it's it's really a, well, it's an ecosystem. Anyway, we uh, also talked about universities, so the need to um, have uh, competitive university. Imagine that you had a soccer team or football team that we pay uh, at a mean wage. You know, tenth division, first division, everybody would get the same salary or same wage. I can guarantee that we would have never been a world champion. And universities, same thing. Don't talk about football or soccer. No, I. <laughs> I like to be provocative, though. Imagine uh, soccer without immigrants. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, the university is uh, it's the same. You need to reform universities. Uh, civil servants are paid the same salary, whether you're productive or not. It's the same mean average salary. We don't do that for journalists. We don't do that for high-level uh, sportsmen, but we do that for researchers. Other topic, but I, sh I want to talk about NG our wonderful uh, electro-nuclear power plants, which were financed with uh, public money. Uh, and uh, we were in uh, an overcapacity for years and years. So it's a risk that was uh, uh, covered by its EDF, not NG. OK. But you were um, uh, boasting on the electro-nuclear project uh, it was a success in the long term, but it was very costly, and those who paid for the risk are the taxpayers. Uh, it was public money. So that was rapidly the different the topics that were covered, and I agree that we need to uh, ha have a taste for risk, but it's the institutions often that are the problem beyond the people. So question that I see here. Thank you, Manu. In comparison with the 20, 2008 crisis, weren't the insurers, the bad students and the bankers, the good pupils um that's a question yes well we can i can try to find a response to that and i think that frankly on that topic we have an adjournmento to do uh, yeah. uh what it what we've learned us insurers uh it's undeniable we weren't perfect but i uh, well, two lessons from that. First thing is we have to be much clearer on what's covered, insurable, and what is not covered and not insurable. And this, uh, we did not do the right pedagogy for that. I think we have a professional trade which is uh, in the aristocracy of uh, accountancy, general conditions, and uh, it's very difficult to expl explain clearly our usefulness, where our uh, usefulness is real, but it's not perceived as the, at the level it should be. So we have a lot of work, pedagogy to do on that. And the second topic is that our trade consists in making the stressful aspect of risk disappear behind statistics. The probability that a coin will fall on either side of the coin, you know, it's 50-50. So you say the risk is 50-50-50. But in, the re in real life, you have uh, heads or tails. But if you choose heads, well, then you have to be sure to know what you're going to do if it's tails. And so this imposes a form of responsibility of your choice. And that is really emotional. Our clients make choices and when you have a claim uh, or a disaster or a, a damage well uh, there's emotion behind that and we tend to find a refuge behind numbers behind but we have to take into account uh, emotions and that's a good lesson and beyond, besides what happened with the pandemic there's a lot of lessons in terms of innovation and audacity uh, for uh, insurers so failures in Europe I've dropped by 18% 2020. You can say that not everybody uh, played the score, bankers, insurers, uh, the state. But collectively, we all uh, played our score. We protected businesses, minus 18% of failures, significant number, or bankruptcies, and we protected employment. <coughs> so I think there's no, <coughs> we played collectively and quite well. The answer of insurers. 
Stefan, back to the questions. You say we played according to the rule on businesses. When you see uh, the uh, equity uh, uh, on a Samaritan and the popular hire, how do you position yourself on that? Well, in fact, it goes back to the question of the main risks that we have today. It seems that the main risk, and it's in line with your question, is returning to the old music. It's uh, losing in 1940 the return to Mark Bloch and the elite has failed and we have to change the elite, whether it's scientific, political, or economic. The second risk is always related to the question. It's denying reality. We are in a universe, and you know it better than I, with crisis that uh, followed crisis after crisis, and that are crazy, terrorism, financial crisis, uh, epidemiological crisis. And the third risk, on attack. Is this uh, music that we hear, which is very French? Uh, well, let's take a short break here. Let's take our time. We've just uh, gone through something that was difficult, and we have to take our time. I think uh, radically the opposite. I think it's a uh, it's a crisis that calls for accelerations. Our uh, Chinese uh, friends, our American friends are absolutely not taking a break right now. Our main world co uh, competitors in uh, my sector, they're not taking a break. They have went through the crisis wonderfully well. And we're talking about essential trade and, uh, and, and uh, sales. And they were just speeding up. They gained momentum. They're, they, 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 they have a predator model. Uh, Amazon is uh, acquiring all kinds of rights, you know, in sports and things. They're shaping uh, everything. And I think uh, uh, to be audacious today is, I'm sorry, it's not giving ca uh, uh, a lot of importance on these actions. Audacity today is to speed up, accelerate, take risks. I live as a failure in the company I represent today. Um, uh, 20 years ago, what was it was what it was, and today we're uh, we have Amazon, which is Amazon. We don't have a European Amazon, so uh, halfway solutions, uh, halfway measures, five-year plans. That's over. That's done. We have to be radical in our transitions or transformations. It's not fun to hear, you know. I would like to say we need to protect everybody. We need a break. We're tired, but I don't think we have a choice as a company, as an enterprise, as uh, the, the uh, head of Carrefour. We have no choice. The the country doesn't have a choice. We have to accelerate in its reforms. The country has to take risks because if we don't take these risks and uh, grant too much importance to this, this will end up in a few years in, uh, in a situation of being declassified. Being, and if we have to take risks to avoid that, we have to take them collectively. So we were track up. Oh, we're done. So these are the last famous last words very briefly in a nutshell because we're going to be kicked out of here so very briefly yes uh, up, up. well uh, we decided that they should had to be written i think so very quickly so you see the previous round table is waiting to kick us out yes okay I've I totally agree that we're faced with a crisis of acceleration. We have to react rapidly. Attack in the Samaritan doesn't concern us. But for us, there's a major uh, element is that the difficulty that we face to develop our renewable projects in France. And I think that we don't we don't say, let's wait and see. No, we mobilize. Catherine our mobile, is mobilized to try to explain to each and every one why it's essential to continue this uh, energy transition. My last word, I would say, be careful with the expression zero risk. Let's just take it out of our vocabulary and we will find the way of audacity. Uh, go wild. Uh, I think we should rehabilitate the couple uh, um, uh, yield and risk. I think uh, living is a risk, but I didn't get that. <laughs> Uh, so it's my last risk, sir. Uh, quick question. Audacity. No microphone. We need audacity. We need to be bold. So here we're talking about the survival of the human race. And we 
have to be careful. Talking about Mad Max, but he doesn't have a microphone. Sorry, no microphone, no translation. Yeah, Monsieur Lorenzi. Oh. Oops, sorry. <laughs> for uh, be audacious and less for uh, stake stockholders you know who take less risk so that would enable to avoid social explosion this morning we had politicians who sent back to the the world of before with austerity politics and they know what that led to so uh, be, let's be audacious and let's be uh, um, let's be at the level of what's expected from us and what history is expecting from us. Thank you.